uh, in our current science, there are four basic forces, electromagnetism, gravity, and the strong and the weak forces which occur in the nucleus, and they hold the nucleus of atoms together. And, you know, in our, in our physics research, we've been learning how to unify these forces to some extent, and there's now a standard model that has a way of putting together three of them uh, to some extent. But um, in current physics, there's an attitude that this pretty much explains everything you need to know in the universe. Uh, unfortunately, that idea is based on the fact that our knowledge of physics comes from high energy particle experiments. Scientists take elementary particles and bang them together at high speed and they watch what happens and they say, well, that's the universe. Okay, that's what we have to explain. And our current model does a pretty good job of explaining that. What they've overlooked are a lot of other phenomena that they don't tend to study. And uh, if you take the example I mentioned of, of, of ESP or psychic uh, connections, uh, that's one area which says that there are forces and ways of interacting that can't be explained by that four force model. When scientists measure the capabilities of subtle energy or the psychic force, it outperforms all of the other forces. Today, we store and transmit information through radio and television waves. This kind of information is likened to human consciousness, but it doesn't possess all of its qualities. Consciousness is still unique and more powerful. Radio waves and microwaves are used to broadcast voices and television pictures at the speed of light. The problem is these electromagnetic signals get weaker over distance and can distort or collapse when trying to move through solid barriers such as walls, metal, or even mountains. After conducting hundreds of tests, scientists have discovered that subtle energy, the psychic force, is capable of penetrating any dimension, barrier, or distance with no loss in signal quality, even through vast distances in space. The Princeton Pair Lab uh, experiments have also shown that people's minds have the ability to affect things at a distance. They take a device called a random event generator, which makes a sequence of random ones and zeros or yeses and nos based on a quantum circuit. What they have shown is that the mind can affect how that object behaves, what the stream of ones and zeros looks like. And it does not depend how far away you are from the person influencing the experiment. Even thousands of miles away, a person is able to affect the results just as well. So we have an ability to exert a force on distant objects that does not fall into uh, any of the known category of forces. This new force uh, goes through barriers that would normally stop the known forces. Uh, it even acts backwards in time in certain types of experiments. This new force, uh, the Russians have called torsion, is known by a variety of different names. It may be the same thing as what the Chinese call qi, the essence of Chinese medicine, it appears to affect space and time and by doing so it affects all the other forces and it really calls for a new re-examination of physics. Uh, Bill Tiller has called this raising the gauge. Dr. William Tiller has conducted hundreds of tests proving that human consciousness or intention can affect the pH value of water over any distance and through any barrier or dimension. Well, let's start with the unstated assumption that's been existing in science for 400 years since the days of Descartes. And that is that no human qualities of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. And so in 97, I set out to seriously test that assumption, uh, having received some important funding.
from a private source. And so the idea was to design uh, four target experiments, set them up with all the kinds of controls you would have in any normal uh, orthodox science experiment, and to then introduce consciousness into the experimental medium. Uh, the four experiments were to, the intention was to increase the pH of water by one full pH unit with no chemical additions. Um, and the uh, water was in equilibrium with air. The second target experiment was to decrease the pH of the same water by one pH unit with no chemical additions, and again in equilibrium with air. And in both cases, the, the accuracy of the measurement instruments were plus or minus 0 0.01 pH units. So we were asking for a signature, which was the order of 100 times the noise. First, Dr. Tiller did experiments applying direct human intention to water and got positive results. He then was able to capture a human intention as if in a computer hard drive in a bioelectrical intention host device with the instructions to raise or lower the pH value in water. Regardless of distance, repeatedly, the intention was able to affect the pH value in water. Within three weeks, the pH had gone up one pH unit. And then three months later, the Milan folks weighed in and we said the same thing to them to be part of the experiment. We wanted them to just measure background. Um, and we used it as a control site for, again, the three active sites. And within one week, the pH went up 1.7 pH units. And we looked at our data. We found in one of the control sites in Missouri, it was underground. And there, the pH had gone up 1.7 pH units. So what we gathered, not only was there information entanglement, over as much as 6,000 miles, but that if the measurement site was below ground, the pH went up more than one pH unit. If it was three stories up in the air, as it was in Bethesda and Baltimore, it only went up 0 0.8 pH units. But if it was at ground level, it went up one pH unit, which was the level where we first made the imprint intention into the devices. Another amazing quality the psychic force exhibits is no distortion between sender and receiver. That means the lines of communication remain private. Well, I'm Gary Schwartz, and I'm currently a professor of psychology, medicine, neurology, psychiatry, and surgery at the University of Arizona, where I direct a laboratory for advances in consciousness and health. And I direct a team of people doing research that essentially integrates body, mind, and spirit. I've been doing a lot of research in the area of energy healing and consciousness that involves energy and also extends beyond us. So where one person's consciousness and energy can affect the physiology, biochemistry, cellular function, and conscious experience of someone else, either locally in a close proximity or even hundreds or thousands of miles away. And that's summarized in my new book, The Energy Healing Experiments. Well, we've done many kinds of experiments to look at both local and non-local or distal effects of intention on healing. One area of research involved was called biophoton imaging, where we literally, using a super-cooled camera, it's cooled anywhere from minus 70 to minus 100 degrees centigrade. These cameras were originally designed to look out into deep space to photograph galaxies we cannot see with the naked eye. Well, we began to wonder if we could use these cameras to actually image living systems. So instead of looking out at the space, we're looking at biology. And we began working with plants. And one of the many reasons for working with plants, besides they're fundamental to life and they relate to light and we are very much part of the, connect with the, the plant community. But plants are also very easy to work with because they can sit in the dark for long periods of time. They sit still. And so therefore you can get very good images of the light that the plants emit. 
And what we found is that not only can we measure the light that's coming out of the plants, which you cannot see with the naked eye, but we can measure auras that are actually surrounding the plants. So you can see the light that's going on around the plants. Then we can actually see how the plants interact with light. So for example, if you have two geranium leaves, one next to the other, and you take a long exposure, you can actually see the extension of the light. And it's like lightning grabbing one another and caressing one another. You actually see the light beams um, connecting the two, which again, has never before been seen. Now you can take healers, and healers can, for example, send healing inten intentions to a leaf, or they can be specifically asked to say, can you enable the leaf to glow more? And then we could actually show that people who are, who are trained as healers can actually, without touching the leaves, with their intention, send an intention for the, the leaves to spontaneously glow more. And then we can place them in, the, in this completely dark chamber where, the, where these images are obtained and lo and behold discover that the leaves are glowing. Now you take that one step further and you could say, well, what about people from a distance? Could people do this 10 miles away? Could they do this 100 miles away or even 1,000 miles away? And with Lynn McTaggart, who wrote the book The Field and has written a new book called The Intention Experiment, we've been doing long distance experiments where, for example, a group of 400 people in England will together as a group for 10 minutes send an intention to a leaf in Tucson in my laboratory to glow. And we'll have two leaves, um, we'll call them leaf A and B. Each leaf has been injured. It's been, um, little holes have been placed in it, 16 of them in a four by four grid. Because when you injure a leaf, it actually glows more. Because, because when there's injury, there's actually a, a, the healing response involves energy. And then what we do is we have two video cameras, cam recorders, picking up the images of each of the leaves and then sending by the internet to England. Now, someone in the audience flips a coin and it comes out randomly heads or tails and let's say they pick leaf B. At this point, the image from Tucson being sent to London of leaf B is now on the screen. And now 400 people can simultaneously send glowing intentions to the leaf that they see. Meanwhile, my research assistant in Tucson, Mark, he's blind to which leaf has been selected. Okay. After the 10 minutes, Mark is then asked to, to take the leaves and put them into the biophoton imaging system so we can collect these long exposure images of the leaves. And then they're blindly scored uh, before we you know, break the code to find out what happens. And much to my absolute amazement, sure enough, if leaf B was selected from a distant group and they could actually see the leaf, they're able to affect the glowing of that leaf compared to a match.